Jesus 2020. There we go. Our only hope. I've seen people have the statement on a yard sign. Man, I appreciate that. You know, there's signs for everybody. There's one that's above all the rest. His name is Jesus. As Christians, our hope is not in this world. As Christians, our hope is not in the things of this world. As Christians, our hope is not in Washington, D.C. As Christians, our hope is not in a political party. As Christians, our hope is not in a political candidate or a politician. My hope is not in the United States of America. There is a singular source for hope, and his name is Jesus. It can be too easy, church, for us as Christians to pin our hope on a politician. It can be too easy to look at a, at a political leader and say, well, if we get them in office, then everything will be good. Let me tell you, you know what? Every single candidate of both parties on every ballot in this nation, what they all have in common, they're all flawed. They're all human. None of them are perfect, and none of them, even if they have the best intentions in the world, none of them ought to be where our hope lies, because if you put your hope in man, man will always let you down. And I'm concerned in the church that many are putting their hope in, in, in an election and in a candidate. And if you are, what could happen is you could all of a sudden have the rug pulled out from under you if the election doesn't go the way you want the election to go. There are some things that are true and constant regardless of what happens in an election. And I just feel the sense of the urgency of the Holy Spirit to remind you of them today. That we need to be reminded of where our hope is, especially in uncertain days and times like we're living. This week, we're having an election, and who knows when we're even going to know what happens in the election. We need to pray. So here's what I want to talk to you today. Regardless of who wins the election, regardless of who wins the election, number one, Jesus is still our hope. As Christians, we better continue to realize there's no hope anywhere else. You'll get really disillusioned if you put your hope in the wrong place. And some Christians, I think, are, are, are at the verge of that. Now, again, I don't want to at all trivialize or minimize what I said at the beginning. You need to vote. But here's the deal. Whoever you vote for, what, they are a person. They're a political candidate. And I think we are in danger of saying, oh, God wants this one, and this is, this is God's candidate. And almost taking them to the point of replacing Jesus with a person. And that ought not to be. Because they are not our hope. Don't replace Jesus with a politician. They're not your source. Jesus is Jehovah Jireh. He's the one who will supply. It's not through just getting the right person in office who will have the right kind of, of policies that we agree with. And here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope. Do you notice the name that Paul gave? I love this name. It's a name of God, the God of hope. He is the God of hope. In, the, in, in one translation, it says the God of all hope. There's not hope in anybody else, only him. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the name of your God is the God of hope. Hope is his name. So why should we be wringing our hands and worried? If you're worried over, oh, what's going to happen and, and all these other things, we just better pray about it and trust it to him because he is the God of all hope. And then we can overflow with hope. Irregardless of what happens. Hope ought to be just overflowing. It ought to be so full in us, it comes out. And 2020 is the year for the church to be able to demonstrate that to the world. Because there's a whole lot of hopeless people out there. There's a whole lot of people that are wondering, man, what's going on? And why is this? And why is that? You can't have real hope until you know Jesus. Everything else is fake and false and temporary. But real hope, I'm talking about eternal hope, comes only through Jesus Christ. He is the source of hope. And what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, he said, you need to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you. Now, couple what Peter said there. Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's in you with what Paul said here in Romans. Because his hope should be overflowing out of us. It ought to just be gushing out on the right side and the left side. When you go into work and everybody else is going, oh, man, I just hate this. Oh, man, I don't know what's going on. You ought to be the one going, oh, man, isn't it wonderful? Some of you that have been in the church for a while remember Tony Calusa. Tony was such an incredible man of God. He was an older man, and I got to spend a little bit of time with him. We, he was an electrician, and he did some work around the church, and I got to be around Tony a little bit. And you would say, you just walk up to him. You, know, you, you ask people, how are you doing today? And they say, good, how are you doing? That's kind of it. But... If you would ask Tony how he was doing, oh, he'd get a big smile. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, and he'd, he would immediately just start talking about, oh, my Lord, he's been so good to me. My Jesus has been so wonderful to me. And if anybody just asked him, how you doing today? That was his opportunity to give God all the praise. There was hope just bubbling out of him. Does that identify who you are? When you walk into work tomorrow and people see you come and do, they go, wow, wow, look at, they're coming in here. Look at the hope in them. Peter said that there ought to be such hope that people come and ask you, why are you like you are? Sometimes people ask me, why are you like you are? Because I'm a little weird. We ought to be different from the world in that they're hopeless. But I've got a hope that's beyond here. And on my hardest day and on the worst day in the worst situation, I've still got a hope in the Lord that is beyond whatever the circumstance is that I'm in the middle of. Regardless of what happens, Jesus is still our hope. And you ought to be so full of hope that people would look at you and go, how can you have hope? Look at what you've been through. Look at what's going on. Look at this. Look at that. And you ought to be the one going, oh, let me tell you. My hope comes from a source beyond here and beyond now. Paul wrote this to the church in Rome. He said, you ought to just be overflowing with hope. They were hunkering down. They were being slaughtered just because they named the name of Jesus. And Paul said, oh, and you know what you should be doing in the middle of that? Overflow with hope. Overflow with hope. Regardless of who wins the election, Jesus is still our hope. And then secondly, God is in control. Sometimes it seems like the world's out of control. Maybe you've felt that not only with everything that we've been through 
in this world, but personally. Maybe your world's kind of out of control, and you thought, man, I didn't think this would happen this way, and I didn't think this situation would turn out this way, and maybe you're in the middle of challenges you didn't anticipate. Maybe it's a health crisis, or maybe it's a family issue, or you know, whatever it is. Let me tell you, when things are out of your control, they are not out of his control. God is still in control. He's working, and sometimes we just, we see it from down below from a human perspective, and we cannot see how he's working. Here's what he said in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 8. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. You think, well, Lord, here's what I want you to do. When we pray about a situation, we tell the Lord what the situation is, and then we tell him how he should work to fix this situation. Because that's what makes sense to us. It's fine. We need to make our needs known before the Lord. But he said, listen, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything that you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God is working on a bigger scale than you and I can even fathom. And sometimes we get in the middle of a situation, and I've heard Christians say, if this election goes wrong, it's the end of Christianity as we know it. Think about that statement for a moment. Now, again, let me go back and underscore what I said at the beginning. We need to pray. We need to vote. But if the election in one nation on this planet at one time in history can stop the church, you have trivialized the death of Jesus Christ for his church. You have trivialized what he said. He said, listen, I will build my church and the very gates of hell itself shall not prevail against my church. It doesn't matter who wins the election. God's still in control. He's still large and in charge. Somebody say amen right there with me. Sometimes I don't know how God's moving. I don't know what is going on. And I love it. The worship team sings that song. I don't even know the name of that song, but it just says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. God, you don't, you, you don't, you don't stop working. I may not see it. I may not understand it. I may be walking through the middle of a, of a valley that I don't understand why I'm going through this. But God, I know that you're still moving and you're still working. We need to pray. We need to register. We need to vote. But then we need to understand this truth from God's word. Romans chapter 13 verse 1 says this. Let every soul be subject to to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. We tend to really like that scripture. When there is someone who is in office that we agree with. Can I just be honest with you? When they're doing what we think that they should be doing, we go, hey, I'll tell you what, God put them in there. They're God's man. It says right there, God put them up there. And then somebody else comes into office who takes stands that are against God's word. And then we go, well, no, you know, that doesn't apply to them. But I just want you to think of the historical context here. When, when Paul wrote these words, inspired by the Holy Spirit to the church in Rome, okay, this was around 55, 56 AD, and the guy in charge, his name was Nero. He was the governing authority. His goal was to kill as many Christians as he could. Literally, just 
the, the crime was you're a Christian, so they would, they would tear them apart. Can you imagine it? To light the streets of Rome at night. Have you ever heard the, the phrase Roman candle? You know, the, you know where the phrase came from, right? Because they would take bodies of Christians and put them on poles and light them on fire to light the streets of Rome. And Paul wrote to the people that were under that guy's authority, and he said, listen, all authority comes from God. Now, you think we've got some rough politicians in the United States of America. Things were bad. But the church thrived. And they said, you know what? There's authority here. And here's the idea. All this authority, it's temporary. God just gave them a tiny little drop of authority for just a tiny little speck of time, and they're going to be gone, and he's still going to be on the throne. And so they've just got a little bit, and they might get th their big head thinking, man, I am all powerful. I am almighty. Man, I'm really something. I could do whatever I want to do. But he said, you need to have hope because God is bigger than that. God is in control. God is he's working above all of that. You know, here's the truth. God is in control of who is in control. Yeah, we need to vote, we need to pray, we need to make our voice known. God's ultimately in control of who's in control. He can bring one up and he can pull them down. He can set somebody else and put them up and he can pull them right back down. Let me share with you, I love the United States of America. I'm patriotic. I mean, I, I love this nation. I'm so thankful for this nation. I'm so thankful that I was raised to love the United States of America. But I will tell you, my hope is not in the United States of America. My citizenship, you know, my passport says I'm a citizen here. But my citizenship isn't here. It's in another country that's got a whole lot more hope than the United States of America. Bill and Gloria Gaither wrote this beautiful song. We used to sing it all the time. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, there's just something about that name. He's Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Now that's truth right there. Because his name is above every other name. His throne's above every other throne. If Jesus tarries, I don't know what's going to happen to the United States of America. Here's what I know is going to ultimately happen. There won't be a United States of America. Because the kingdoms of this world will all become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. So ultimately, there's not going to be a United States of America. There's not going to be Canada and Mexico, and there's not going to be all these other nations. It's all going to come together under him. I don't know at what point the United States of America is going to cease to exist. If my hope were only in this country, then, man, my hope, it doesn't matter if my hope is, is for five years, ten years, fifty years, a hundred years, a thousand years. It's still temporary. But my hope is in a kingdom that is forever and ever and ever and ever. Say, Pastor, what if somebody gets elected that takes a stand opposite of the word of God? I mean, what if, what if somebody gets elected who's going to raise my taxes? 
and then use the money for things that are not according to God's word. Well, Pastor, what if somebody gets elected who's already said that what they believe is contrary to God's word? Then you know what? God's still in control. God's still in control. Somebody say, God is still in control. Regardless of who wins the election, Jesus is still our only hope. God is still in control. And persecution of the church will increase. You probably didn't want to shout on that one. I'm going to mention this quickly and I'm going to move on. Jesus told us that persecution of the church was coming. He said it multiple times. And we are not immune to the persecution of the church. We have seen it to a small degree in this nation. It's going to increase as the days, close, as we get closer and closer and closer to the rapture of the church. The church will be persecuted. And, and we sometimes, I think, have the mistaken thought that if we get the right person in office, then there won't be persecution of the church. It doesn't matter who's in office. The church is going to be persecuted. It may come more swiftly with one than another, but it's coming. There will come a time when certain parts of what this word says will be illegal to be preached from a pulpit because they will say it is intolerant. This message that you are preaching is hate speech. You know, the Bible just tells us what's right and what's wrong. And when you are doing what's wrong and you want to call it right, then you have to try to shut up the voices of truth. But here's the great thing about the persecution coming. The church, historically has thrived when persecution comes. Hear your pastor. The church historically has not done particularly well when the church gets affluent. The church does better when the church gets persecuted because the church gets on their knees. Let me just ask you to ponder a question. What's really our goal? Because my goal isn't that I get somebody in political office and try to force my will. My goal really is I want souls. I want to see a harvest. I want revival. And I I don't know what what all that's going to take. I want the church to be in prayer and in intercession. To the point that if it takes persecution, then Jesus bring persecution. I want you to just consider it. Now, I'm not asking you to go be a martyr and pray that, oh, Lord, please let us get persecuted. But I am asking you to say, I'd rather have Jesus. I want to see revival sweep this nation and souls come to the altar and people come under the conviction of the Holy Ghost so that they turn their lives over to Jesus Christ in repentance because he's coming soon for his bride. And that's more important than anything we suffer temporarily in between. I said I'd just hit that one quick. I'll just hit it quick. Regardless of who wins the election, Jesus is still on the throne. God's still in control. Persecution of the church will increase. And there's still power in Jesus' name. Names matter. Names are important, but no name matters more than the name of Jesus. When you say Jesus, literally, here's what his name means. It means Jehovah will save. Salvation is in his name. There's salvation in no other name. 
Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is salvation. Jesus Christ, and Christ isn't his last name. Christ is his role. He is Jesus the Christ. The Christ means he is the anointed one. He is salvation who is anointed. He is the rescuer. He is the savior. He is the deliverer. He is the almighty one who has anointing flowing through him for everything that you'll face. If persecution comes, then there's power in the name of Jesus Christ to give you the ability to be able to walk through whatever you've got to walk through for him. There is still an anointing on the church regardless of what happens tomorrow regardless of what the news media is saying regardless of who wins an election regardless of where other people are wringing their hands the church still has the authority in the name of Jesus Christ his name is still above every other name Philippians chapter 2 says, Therefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. It's above your name. It's above my name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee is going to bow. Politicians all want you to know their name. They put their name, place their name everywhere. They want you to remember their name. You need to remember a name that's above all other names. Last month, Donald Trump was speaking. He said, I was talking to a lady, and she said, you're the most popular person in the world. She said, you're, you are, I can't believe I'm talking to you. You are the most powerful person that there is in the whole world. And he said, I looked at her, and I said, no, no, I'm not. And she said, well, who is more powerful than you? And he said, Jesus Christ. He got it right on that one. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. Some are going to confess it because they make a decision to now. Some are going to confess it later. And it's too late later to impact your eternal destiny. You need to make the decision right now. You know, when, when, it's, when it's hard and when it's difficult and when persecution comes, you need to remember what Luke said. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent out 70. And he sent them out, and they went out as his witnesses, and they came back, and they were rejoicing. And here's what it said in verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now, Jesus said, that's not the real reason to rejoice. You need to rejoice because your name is written. Right? You need to rejoice because you're one of mine. This isn't what you go around just kind of strutting about. But the truth is still the truth. Notice, the demons are subject to us, not because we did anything, in your name. Demons are subject to his name. Spirits of condemnation that come at you, you need, to, you need to just begin to speak the name of Jesus. Jesus. You know what? Demons hate his name. 
Every knee's got to bow. You know what? I, I like making demons miserable. They can't stand worship of his name. They can't stand you to exalt his name. You ought to just bring his name with you into every day, every place you walk, everywhere you go. When you get into work, you go on the job. You just make demons just uncomfortable to even come around you or try to attack you. Because as soon as they do, that spirit would, would come against you. You know, sometimes there's a spirit of intimidation that will come against you. There's a spirit of condemnation that comes against you. There's a spirit of division. Maybe there's a spirit of temptation. You just need to combat that and say, Jesus, 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 Jesus is my Lord. Because every time you say his name, you know what? The demon, he's trying to attack you. He's trying to come at you. And you say, Jesus, you know what I believe happens in the spirit? You can't see it. But I think right there, the demons hear his name and they have to go, Jesus is Lord. They got to bow their knee. In heaven, in earth, and underneath the earth, when they hear his name, they've got to bow their knee. They tremble at the mention of his name. You need to have his name on your lips continually. Jesus, 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 Jesus. There's still power in his name. Sometimes, Jessica, if you're around me, sometimes I'll just get thinking about a situation. I feel overwhelmed. I'm talking to the Lord, and all she'll hear from me. I mean, I could just be walking around, or I could just be doing whatever, driving. I'm just, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I'm just speaking his name over the situation. Sometimes I don't even know how to pray over a situation, and I just speak Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Sometimes I'm troubled in my spirit, and I don't know where to turn, and I speak his name and peace comes when you just speak out his name just say the name that's above every other name can I tell you there's no salvation in any other name Donald Trump doesn't have salvation in his name Joe Biden doesn't have salvation in his name Pastor Carson doesn't have salvation in his name but when you say Jesus 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 salvation Salvation is his name. You know, the lordship of Jesus isn't threatened by who sits in the Oval Office. I don't know who made the chair that sits behind the resolute desk in the Oval Office, but it ain't nothing compared to the throne that my God sits on in heaven. He's above it all. He's above it all. June 21st of this year, there was a message in tongues and interpretation. And we... Type these out because we value the word of the Lord. I want you to hear what the Lord spoke in this sanctuary just several months ago. My name is a stronghold for you to run into. My name is a hiding place for you to hide when when you are weary. My name is a fortress for you to run into when there's nowhere else to go. But I tell you, my name is greater than all of that. My name will keep you. My name proceeds before you and goes after you. My name will lift you up. My name will heal you and deliver you and protect you from all harm. My name. When you speak my name, the power of God encases you and surrounds you. For my name is bold and wonderful and above all other things. There's power in his name. regardless of who wins the election. 
Jesus is still our only hope. God's in control. Persecution of the church will increase. There's power in Jesus' name. And revival is coming. There's a last day's awakening. It doesn't matter who wins the election. He's calling his bride to himself. I believe we've only seen just the beginning. We've seen this year already. We are in revival. We've seen so many people come to the Lord. Many of them, it's not the way that we thought. It's not the way that we thought we would see it. And the Lord spoke that to us at the beginning of this year. There'll be an awakening. There'll be revival. It won't look like what we expect revival to look like. But as you look around the room, look at the people that are in the room. And here's what I want you to know. There are many people who are faithful, committed members of this church who, because of the current circumstance, they're watching through that camera lens right now or whichever one I'm on. They're at home, but this church has seen a huge increase of salvations this year. In the middle of a shutdown, stopping church, having to change everything, and having all these other issues going on, we've seen salvation after salvation after salvation and rededication, people coming back to Jesus, people surrendering their life to the Lord. We've seen it over and over, and it's only the beginning. Here's what I'm believing the Lord. I don't know when Jesus is coming. He's coming soon. But for every day that we've got, I'm just asking God, Lord, increase. I'm believing for more. I'm believing for more. You know, we're Conneaut Church of God, right? You know what Conneaut means? You know, Conneaut's an Iroquoian word. It's, a, it's an Indian word. It means there is an increase. Did you know that? That's the, that's the label that's on the front of the building out here. This is the there is an increase, Church of God. There's an increase in anointing. There's an increase of harvest. There's an increase of prodigals coming back home. There's an increase of souls. There's an increase. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter who wins the election. There's an increase coming from the throne room to the church. There is revival. I'm going to show you one thing quickly in Scripture. Joel prophesied in Joel chapter 2, and most of you know it. He said that in the last days, saith God, I'll pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men are going to see visions. Your old men will dream dreams upon my servants and handmaids. I'll pour out of my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. That's Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. Then in Acts... On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and Peter quoted that when they all got filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke in tongues. Peter said, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he said, it's not only to you, it's to your children and to their children and to all those that are afar off. That's you and me. We're 2,000 years removed to all those that are afar off. But part of the prophecy of Joel, when you jump back a little bit Earlier in chapter 2, here's what he said. Joel chapter 2, verse 23. He said, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former. Somebody say former. The former rain faithfully, and he'll cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now, they had two seasons of harvest, and they needed a rain for the first harvest, and then they had a latter rain for the second harvest. And he said there's going to be this first harvest, there's going to be a rain, and in the Scripture, rain symbolizes the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come down in the former rain. That happened in the, the first century. That happened in A.D. 29. It began, and, and the church was born with Pentecostal fire, and they were speaking in other tongues, seeing God do miracles and healings. And then he said, there'll be a latter rain. The latter rain comes just before the final harvest. 
There might have been a long, dry summer in between. There might have been a time when you wondered, I don't know if it'll ever rain again because it's been dry and we've been weary and we've been struggling. But then he said there's going to come a latter rain. But Joel specifically said he's going to give you not just the latter rain. You're going to look back and see that former rain. He's going to give you that and then he's going to double it. You're going to get a double portion rate. Former and latter rain are all coming together because the harvest that's coming is greater than any harvest you've ever seen. This is the day of the latter day outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the church that I believe you're going to see young people begin to speak in other tongues and prophesy, have gifts of the Spirit in operation. We're going to see those things that we had only thought in our mind we would see. Generations have been praying for prophecies that have been hanging over our heads for years now will be fulfilled God do it in these last days there's a revival I don't care who's in the White House I don't care who's in the Senate I don't care who's over there in Congress and what they stand up at a microphone and say here's what I know there's revival coming from the throne room to the church You may have trepidation about what's coming. About the elections. Everything else that's happening. Jesus is still our hope. God's still in control. Persecution's going to increase, but there's power in Jesus' name. And revival's coming. You feel yourself starting to lose hope. I just want you to remember. Jesus. 2020. He's our only hope. He's our only hope. He's our only hope. Maybe today you're in a place that you're not quite sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ, whether you're sitting in this room, whether you're watching right now. If you don't know Jesus, this is your opportunity. If you don't know Jesus, I want to invite you today Surrender your life to him. If you've been living your life for yourself, if you've been walking in sin and you know it, maybe you used to walk with him, but you, you haven't been. You've been out doing all kind of other things in the world. He's calling you back home. He's calling you back to closeness with him today with heads bowed and eyes closed without anybody looking around today. There's salvation in no other name. He is here right now as they play softly the presence of the Holy Spirit is here in this place those of you that are watching he's there with you and I want to ask you today with nobody looking around heads bowed and eyes closed if you want to recommit your life to the Lord or maybe for the first time you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ would you just slip your hand up today and say, yeah, I just need to surrender my life completely to the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Is there anyone else today? Hallelujah, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He sees those hands. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus gave his life so that if we would repent of our sin and confess him as our Savior and Lord, we would be saved. Whether you're here in this room or whether you're watching today, I'm going to pray a simple prayer of repentance. And I want you to pray these words with me. And those of you that raised your hands, those of you that are watching, would you pray this and know that the Lord is listening this morning. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you to repent of sin and to surrender my life to you. I give you all that I am. I confess you as my Savior and as my Lord. 
Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me today. And give me the strength to live for you every day of my life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah, the Bible said there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels in heaven. Uh, there's multiple people in here who gave their lives to the Lord and probably more online today. So somebody stand to your feet and rejoice before Him. Come on, rejoice before the Lord. God, we thank you for harvest, for souls, for awakening. And if you gave your life to the Lord today, if you're watching online, please let us know. If you're here in the room, let us know. We want to put some information in your hands about the next steps that you need to take in your walk with the Lord. This is an uncertain time, and I believe this week, specifically, there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on. And so the worship team, they haven't done this song in church before, but I actually called Steve yesterday? Yesterday, and I said, hey, can you do this song? <laughs> These guys are so awesome. He said, Pastor, we'll, we'll work on it in the morning. So they ran through this this morning, and we're good, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I told him, I said, yeah, by God's grace, there we go. <laughs> I told him, I said, I want our people before they leave to have a blessing spoken over them. To just have a blessing, biblical blessing. And every word of the song that you're going to sing and have sung over you, these are biblical blessings right straight out of the word of God. So before we leave today, I want you to be part of, one, receiving that blessing, and then here's what I want to challenge you with. Will you take that blessing and go out and release that blessing into someone else? Is that good? Amen. Thank you, guys. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Just sing that again. The Lord bless you. So we believe it. Let's agree. Sing Amen.
upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and their children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children May his presence, may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you, 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 He is for you. in your favor. Hallelujah. I want you to look up there on the screen because as they were singing that, I looked up. You may not know what you're looking at. That's the Conneaut Church of God. 
flew my drone over the property here. You're just on a little tiny part of it. You know, we have 107 acres of land. So that swoops up. You can see we own a massive amount of land back here. And as we're singing that, the Lord just said, you know what? My favor is over this. My favor is over this. My favor is over my people here. I want to pray one final blessing, and I want to encourage you. This is not for us just to take and hold. This is for us to release, to release. God's going to give you divine appointment this week to begin to just release, to release into somebody that's hopeless, somebody that doesn't have any hope. You give them hope that you have got in Jesus Christ. Let it overflow out of you. Father, I thank you for your blessing. I thank you, Lord, that indeed, Lord, in perilous times, in difficult times, Lord, when challenges come and when we don't know where to turn and it seems like the world is spinning out of control, God, you are in control. Jesus, you're still on the throne. We thank you that there is power in your name. God, I pray that the blessing indeed is over your people today, whether they're in this room or watching right now. Lord, I pray your favor and your blessing over them. And God, I'm asking you that you would anoint us to release blessing. Lord, for those that maybe don't know you, that our hope would overflow so that, Lord, we could give a reason for the hope that we have. And his name is Jesus. Give us divine appointment after divine appointment after divine appointment to be able to share that message of the gospel with someone this week. God, help us to bring hope and everywhere we go. And Lord, we won't fail to give you all the thanks and the praise and the glory and the honor in the name that's above every name. Amen.